Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. I'm Moses Khan, the discipleship pastor here. I'm so glad you're able to tune in. I hope that you are incredibly blessed as you do so. Listen, if you are in the area, check us out at allpeopleschurch.ca to get location details. And if you want to give and support our ministry, you can do so online as well. Well, I hope you're ready and excited to get into the Word of God. Let's do this. Amen, amen. If you are visiting with us this morning, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Moses. Of course, Pastor is not my first name. I made that joke first service as well. And everyone laughed, so thank you for laughing with me. Uh, <laughs> if you've heard me preach before, if you come to our Wednesday night midweek service, you know that I make cheesy jokes. And I am super proud of those jokes. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I do want to welcome you, uh, anyone who is visiting, anyone who may be a guest, I do want to welcome you. If you're watching online, we welcome you as well. I do want uh, to greet you on behalf of Pastor Tony. Uh, I was communicating him with him this morning, and so he sends his love. He was actually, uh, in, he's actually in Ottawa. He's traveling back now, and so he will be back later this day. And so he was in Ottawa doing a wedding. Uh, how many know that Ronnie, I don't know how many of you know him, but he is married. Uh, with Leah, and so that is exciting stuff. Uh, among among that news, we further news is is how many you know. Obviously, I think everyone knows Joel and Christina. H how many have seen? How many have uh, heard that they have just had a precious baby daughter, Isabella Hope Tiffin? There she is. She is gorgeous, with those nice chubby cheeks. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And so I want to I wanna welcome you men. I want to remind you that we are meeting tomorrow evening. Also, next Friday is uh, our Elevate conference. So make sure you get your tickets today. When? Oh, my goodness. We're, this is why men get a bad rep, right? This is, what's up with that? When, when are you going to get your tickets? All right. So don't lie. You just said that in the house of God. <laughs> And so we're going to start uh, a new series. I'm going to kick it off. Uh, this is the Why series, and we're going to answer some important uh, questions that, that we have been asking ourselves, maybe people in our life have been asking. But how many know uh, sometimes even when you come to faith uh, in the Lord, if you come into relationship with God, you still have some questions that are left unanswered? Amen? All right. Is, is anyone here this morning? Come on. Amen? Uh, or, or maybe you guys are just smarter than me. You guys don't have any questions. Well, I know I, for myself, have questions. And so oftentimes in our life, we ask questions that are left unanswered. Many people in our circle ask questions that maybe we have a hard time answering. And so we're going to help you in this series to answer some of those tough questions. Uh, the question that I am tackling today, if I can get my clicker, the, the question that I am tackling today is why do I exist? Why do I exist? Why do you exist? In order to, thank you, in order to answer this question, you really have to ask another question, is that question is, did someone create me? Amen? How many of you have kids? How many of your kids have ever drawn you something, have ever made you something, and they come bring it to you, and they say, Dad, Mom, look what I have made. And you're trying to, you're scratching your head, and you're like, what is that? And because you don't want to offend them, right? You don't want to say, oh, that's a great dinosaur. And he says, well, it's supposed to be a basketball. <laughs> uh, and so the best thing to do there is, oh, what did you make? And so the kid, the child will tell you what he or she has created, and you can appreciate their work of art. Amen? Amen. And so how many of you know that if we have a source, rather than guessing why we exist, it's better to go to him and ask him, Lord, why did you create me? Amen? And so to, to answer that question, the question we ask is, did someone create me? If no one created me, then I must just be an accident, and I've got to live this life just to exist. I just got to coast. I got to try my best to find meaning, to find purpose, and at the end, I may or may not be fulfilled with what I have done. Or someone has created me. I, I do have a source. I have inherent value. I have inherent purpose. And whoever created me gets to define what that is. Amen? 
And so the Bible declares that God is the creator of all things, that he purposed the universe into existence, everything in it, including you and I. The stars, the galaxies, the planets, everything you see in this world has been created by God. Which tells me that God is all powerful, God is in control, God is the source of everything, that he is the reason you and I are here today. And so if such a God exists, church, there is one thing I know more clear than anything else, and that is that I must let him define my existence and not define it myself. In fact, if such a God exists, if an all-powerful, uh, all-sovereign, loving, all-wise control, who all, God who always was, who always will be, exists, then the worst thing I can do for myself is define my own existence. That is the worst thing I could do for myself. This morning, we're going to read out of Isaiah chapter 43. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's word this morning. My objective is to show you why you exist. But in order to do that, I kind of have to go back and and go through some history, go through, start at the beginning of when God really created the world. I have to do some, how many enjoy a good history lesson? Good stuff, because I know when I was in history class back in school, I kind of, I didn't like it. And so, The only time I got interested in history was when it was about his story. And so the Bible is so fascinating because it can turn boring subjects into such fascinating pieces. Amen. And so so we turn to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to start at verse 1. Is everyone there? Just three of you. Isaiah chapter 43 starting at verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. And so right there, God is established as the creator. He is established as the one who has formed us. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. How many of you know that the creation belongs to its creator? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when, I walk, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. And so not only are you created by God, not only are you formed by his hands, you have inherent value because he loves you and you are precious in his eyes. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and I will bring from the west, and I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed and made this morning, Isaiah tells us that God has created us for his glory. Now, in order to unpack what that means, we've got to start from the beginning, and we've got to go to Genesis, but let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your presence is here through your Holy Spirit. God, I ask that you to be present in every heart and every mind that is here today. God, use my speech. Use my speech, God. God, for what I'm about to do is an impossible task if you are not at work here. And so I need you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Okay, so Isaiah tells us that God has created us for his glory. He has made us. He has formed us. And so let's do a little quick history lesson. Are we, are we ready to go on this journey? Okay, praise God. And so if we go back to Genesis, Genesis 1.27, this is what God says. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? And, and so... The fact that we are made for his glory, the fact that we are created by him and formed by his hands, and the fact that we are made in his image 
means that we are to be reflections of God, right? And so right from the beginning, our purpose is established. Humanity is purposed to what? To glorify God and to reflect him in the earth. Isn't it interesting that when God created, uh, you know, the, the nature, God created the animals, after every day of his creation, he said that it is good right? And so creation reflects God's goodness. Isn't the psalmist say that the heaven declares the glory of the Lord? And so isn't it interesting that creation reflects his goodness, yet humanity was purposed to reflect him. And so we have been purposed to reflect God. That means we are to display him, reflect him. We, we are, as we have dominion, as we take rule, as we uh, create, as we, as, we, as we reason, as we think, as we work, as we do things on this planet, we are called to reflect God. And so the point of being made in God's image is to image God, is to display God. If, if there was an artist and he said, I I'm going to make a painting, I'm going to make a statue after your image, then I would expect that he would have me in mind while he's creating it. A amen? I, I would expect that he would have me in mind while he's, he's forming that statue or he's painting that painting. And by the time he's done with that sculpture or that painting, if you were to look at it, that you would be reminded of me because he has made that thing in my image. And so the same is with humanity. When God created humanity, God purposed humanity to reflect him. And so if, if heaven was to look down after creation, they would see a clear reflection of God himself and they would glorify God. That is what humanity was purposed for. That's what humanity was purposed to do. But then, as the story progresses, as the journey continues, there happens to be an issue. Adam and Eve stray from their God-given purpose. Adam and Eve turn from what God originally designed them to do, and they turn and they listen to the serpent. And the serpent, crafty, uh, crafty and wise, he, he deceives them in order to be disobedient to God, and all of a sudden, sin enters into the world. And so they turn away from being reflections of God. And you know what the first thing they do after they sin is they go hide from the one in whose image they were made. The one who they were created to reflect, they go hide from him because now sin has entered into the world. And so their ability to mirror God has been shattered. They're nothing but broken mirrors. Have you ever tried looking in a broken mirror? You can't figure out where each piece belongs. I mean, the eye is down here and the nose is up here and you don't know what's going on. What am I looking at? And so humanity is broken. And, and, and this is why, church, we see so many broken things in this world today. Isn't it a wonder that we, we ask the question, man, how come there is so much suffering in this world? How come there is so much destruction in this world? How come there's so much chaos in this world? Is because humanity has lost its purpose. Its purpose to display God. It's purpose to be created for the glory of God. That, that image-bearing quality that God purposed us with right from the beginning has been lost. And so now we no longer look at a world and see a reflection of God and a reflection of God's goodness. We look at a world and see a reflection of our brokenness. We see a reflection of our sin. We see a reflection of our selfishness, our desires. We see a world representing sin rather than representing God. And as the story continues, there are the humans, what they do is they gather, okay? They gather because now they're far from God, and all of a sudden, they build this tower, and they call it Babel. And God says to them, or he says to himself, he says, look at these, they, look at these people. They have gone after trying to build a name for themselves. And so all of a sudden, humanity is more interested in themselves rather than the one whose image they are made in. And so God confuses their languages so that they could be spread across the world. And so you see now a humanity that are nothing but broken mirrors. And so our eternal purpose to glorify God, to bear his image, is poisoned. We've been poisoned. Our purpose has been poisoned. And this poisoning has eternal 
consequences. Not on, only are we no longer enabled to bear the image of God, but because we can't bear his image, we cannot be in relationship with God, which means that we are now set to an eternal consequence of life apart from him. And so as our purpose is poisoned, we feel the weight of this eternal consequence. But how many of you know that the story does not end there? Amen. Are, are you still on this journey with me? Still on this journey with me? Amen. And so the story does not end there. The poisoned humanity finds a redeemer. The poisoned humanity finds the one that will purchase their purpose again. And so all of a sudden, God sends his son to purchase our purpose, to do what we could not do because of our broken, sinful nature. God sends his son to restore his own image. And so as God looks into the world, he sees a humanity so broken, so fragile, so sinful, and he says, you can't mirror me. You can't reflect me. You're, you're broken. You're sinful. And I, I've got to fix you. And, and the only way to fix you is to send my son, who is the exact imprint of me, so that he could live a life of perfect sacrificial love towards God the Father and towards the world, and so that he could die on a cross, and that all my fierce hatred towards everything that is evil is poured out on him. I know, I know God says that this is, this is going to be a brutal cost, but it's the only way. It's the only way a, a humanity so broken, a humanity so fragile, so sinful, can come back and be purchased to do what they were purposed and created for, which is to reflect him, to be image bearers of him. And so you and I at once broken once so sinful now we exchange our sinful nature for the perfection of christ for the righteousness of christ and all of a sudden we put on our purchased purpose and so christ is a true example of a life lived for the glory of god Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus later tells his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so he's come to purchase back our, pur our purpose and enable us to be image bearers of God once again. Is that good news, church? And so the way back to this purchase purpose is through repentance and through faith in God. We have to turn away from what? <coughs> oh, praise God, I almost died here. I said I almost died all year laughing. What's going on here? What's going on? Where's the love? We love you. All right, thank you. And so, and so what we have to do, let's get back on track, back on the journey. What we have to do now is turn from what humanity originally turned to. And we have to run towards what humanity originally hid from. And so we have to repent. We have to turn from our sinful desires. We have to turn from our sinful passions. And we have to turn to God and have faith and believe and receive in the Son of God. Because at that moment, what happens is that you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. How many Holy Spirit-filled believers do I got here? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit conforms us into the image of God's Son. Romans 8, 28 and 29, the verse everyone loves to quote. Everyone loves to quote it, right? Isn't it true? I bet you could even quote it even as I say, Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We love that first part, that, that all things work for the good. And we, we kind of just stop right there, uh, don't we? 
All things work together for my good. But the question we have to ask is whether or not we love him and are called according to his purpose. Because, it, you know, I'm a mathematical guy. And so if you take out called according to his purpose, you take out loving God, then all of a sudden all things are not working together for your good. It's simple. And what is the purpose of his will. He, he continues, let me just read the verse for you. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to conform to the image of his son. And so God's purpose, God's will for your life is that you would conform to the image of his son. To reflect him, to display him, to make him known in everything you do. And so the Holy Spirit enables us to passionately pursue the glory of God in all things. Can I say it this way? The purpose of our existence is to display his existence. The purpose of my existence is to display his existence. This is what Colossians 3, 10 says, having put on your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And so our, pur our purpose has been purchased, and we can once again reflect whose image we were made in. So isn't it interesting? I just want to read out of Ephesians verse, chapter 1. This is what Paul says. He says, he predestined us for adoptions as sons before the foundations of the earth to the praise of his glorious grace. Do you know that God saved you not for yourself, but for himself? God saved you so that you would be a display for his glorious grace. And he declared that purpose over you the moment he thought to create you. So he, he purposed you before the foundations of this world. Not the moment he made you, but the moment he thought about making you. He didn't wait for you to grow. He didn't wait for you to develop. He didn't wait for you to uh, gain passions and gain skills to declare a purpose over you. He purposed you before you could even do anything, before you could think, talk, or breathe. He purposed you before you had passions, desires, or wants. He purposed you. He didn't wait to see what you can do to purpose you. He, he didn't wait to see what you're capable of to tell you that you're capable He didn't wait to see what you were made of to tell you that I can use you. He said, I've made you in my image, and I know what I've created, and I know what I've created it for. I'm not like your parents, says the Lord. I'm not like your friends. I'm not like your boss. I'm not like the people you have in your life whose focus when they look on your life is on preference. Isn't it interesting that as we watch our kids grow up, as we, as we even in our work environment, we look at people, we look at the skills they have, and we say, oh, well, maybe God wants you to do that. Uh, we wait for people to develop into this person to declare purpose over them, and God is trying to tell you that I've made you in my image. I purposed you before the foundations of this world. I didn't wait till you come, till you grow, till you develop into some beautiful man, some beautiful woman. I purposed you before the foundations of this world, and your purpose is to glorify me. Church, I need you to know that you have a purpose. You have a purpose. Are we good on this journey so far? Yeah. Praise God. But church, now you have a choice. Am I going to live based on my preferences? Or am I going to live based on God's purpose? Am I going to pursue my preference, which is to pursue my desires, which is to pursue passions outside the will of God? Am I going to pursue my preference? I don't, I don't know about you, church, but, but I am tired of living for myself. I'm tired of living a life pursuing my preferences because, because the moment I do that, I always find out by the end of that journey, I am still lost, I'm still confused, I'm still lonely, I'm still without purpose, I'm still unfulfilled, and I'm still unsatisfied. I still feel empty. I still feel lost, and so I'm tired of chasing my preferences. I want to chase my purpose. 
And I don't know about you, church, but I'm too start. I'm too smart to keep chasing the things that keep failing me. I, I'm too smart now, after all those failures, to keep being seduced by things that don't satisfy. I don't know about you, church, but, but I'm learning from my past mistakes. I'm learning from my past failures. I'm learning the cost of pursuing my preferences. And so what I need you to know, church, is that God is trying to tell you that his purpose trumps your preference. His purpose trumps your preference. I, I know I like things a certain way, but it's, it's not about my preference. It's about his purpose. I, I know I want things. I know I think I need things, but it's not about what I think I need. It's about what God knows I need. And so it's not about preference. It's about purpose. It's about purpose. I, I know they're not playing my favorite worship songs this morning, but worship is not about my preference. Worship is about his purpose. And so because I have been purchased with a purpose to worship my creator, I'm not going to worship out of preference as if worship was about me. I'm going to worship out of purpose because I, that's what, I know that that's what I've been created to do. Preference versus purpose. I, I, I know I'm a man. I've got an image to protect, and so when the worship comes on, I can't raise my hands because I'm a man. I'm going to worship anyways. I'm going to lift my hands up anyways. I don't care what kind of man I think I am, what kind of man other people think I am. It's not about my preference. It's about my purpose. And so I'm going to worship the one who's purchased my preference or my purpose I, I know I'll be uncomfortable but because I'm called I'm not going to focus on what I want to do but I got to do what God wants me to do because it's not about my preference it's about purpose it's about purpose it's not about preference it's about it's about it's about purpose. turn to your neighbor and tell them purpose oh you got to do better than that turn to your neighbor and tell them purpose is greater than preference. Purpose is greater than preference. Because my purpose represents God. My purpose looks to God, but my preference only looks to me. My preference can only go as far as I can take myself, but my purpose, because it's focused on God, will go wherever God can take me, wherever God is willing to lead me, wherever God wants to direct me. And so purpose is greater than preference. My personal purpose is to glorify God by knowing him. Glorify God by knowing him and making him known in all that I do. That is my personal purpose, which I have actually received from the word of God. You are called to glorify God by knowing him, getting into a relationship him in, with him through his son, Jesus Christ, and then making him known in everything you do. That's my purpose. You know that I don't exist to be a pastor. Some of you are like, what? I don't exist to be a pastor. I, I am a pastor. I have a call in my life to be a pastor. I find uh, being a pastor a privilege, a great honor, but it's not my reason for existence. If being a pastor is my reason for existence, then I've limited my reason for existence. I've limited my existence because what happens if I get fired? What happens if I don't want to do this tomorrow? Well, what happens if I lose my job? What happens if I don't feel like being a pastor? What happens then? Have I lost my purpose? See, your purpose has to be greater than what you do. Your purpose has to be greater than the people in your life. Your purpose has to be greater than your circumstances. It has to be something that is constant. I remember in Bible college, I went through two and a half years of depression where I could not see myself be a pastor anymore. 
Imagine trying to finish school, trying to accomplish this degree for something I can't even see myself becoming. And the only thing that kept me going, the only thing that would wake me up, the only thing that would keep me going was God, help me to glorify you. God, help me to display you. God, help me to reflect you even through this season. Because had my purpose been anything other than to glorify and magnify God, I would not have made it through that season. My purpose has to be greater than my circumstances. I don't want a purpose that's limited. I want a purpose that remains. Even if I get fired, even if I lose my family, even if I lose my friends, even if I have no car, no home, no clothes, even if I lose everything, my purpose has to remain. See, your purpose, if your purpose can be lost by losing things in your life, then your purpose is too small. But if my purpose is to glorify God, if my purpose is to be a greater display of him, if if my purpose is to reflect him, then it doesn't matter what comes my way. It doesn't matter the circumstance I fail. It doesn't matter what I lose, how I feel. My purpose still remains. See, church, when my purpose becomes to glorify God in everything I do, then everything becomes a tool to glorify God. Because because once I come to know that I exist for the glory of God, then I can express that through everything I do, right? Right? Everything I do. So, so what does Paul say? Paul declares that do everything for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's why you and I exist, to do everything for the glory of God. And so when I pastor, I pastor to the glory of God. When I preach, I preach to the glory of God. When the worship team sings, they sing to the glory of God. When they play their instruments, they play to the glory of God. When you worship God, you don't pray, you don't play to your, or you don't sing to your feelings. You sing for the glory of God in everything that you do, whether you eat, drink, sleep, whether you get up, walk your kids to the park, whether you love your spouse, whether you play with your children, whether you drink a glass of water, you do it for the glory of God. Parents, you can play with your kids to the glory of God. You can walk your kids to the park for the glory of God. You can cook a nice meal to the glory of God. Here's what you got to understand, church. You've got something to give to this world. And it's not your talents. It's not your abilities. It's God. It's God. I brought a little prop here with me. Renji, do you mind helping me again, my brother? So what I've just given Renji is a telescope. Go ahead and open that. It's a telescope. Helps me feel like a pirate. <laughs> this is how I keep a watch on your life as a pastor. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Church, you exist to be a telescope. You exist to be a telescope. What is the purpose of a telescope? The purpose of a telescope is to make what seems so far. Come up nice and close. What, what seems so far, what seems so unapproachable, you, you exist to be a telescope. And so a telescope, what, what seems so far, Renji, how, how big does my head look now, bro? <laughs> looks pretty big. Looks pretty big. Thank you, Renji. And so you exist to be a telescope by, by the way you live, by the, by the way you work, by the way you play with your kids, the way you spend your money, the way you talk to people, the way you buy groceries, by everything you do, you exist to take a telescope by the observation of your life and put it at the eyes of the world, pointing directly to God. Yeah. 
And so those who observe your life, those who come in contact with you, they don't just see you, but they see the Christ in you. They see God magnified all over your life. And so as the world looks at you, church, they should see the Christ in you, and you ought to magnify God to the world by the way you live. See, our broken world church is in dire need, in dire need of men and women living out their God-given purpose so that they too can be redeemed. They too can live a life that glorifies God. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, church, what, what seems too far to a broken, a sinful people is made approachable by the observation of your life. And as they observe your life, your life shouts, look, look at what God has done. He has taken the broken. He has taken the foolish. He has taken the weak. He has taken the sinful. He has taken the incapable. He has taken the unwise. And he's made a masterpiece out of it. Look. Look at what God has done. And so he conforms us into the image of his son so we can be walking displays of his glory. And again, our reason to exist is to display his existence in everything you do. See, church, we can, we can pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done. But that's not going to work until we are willing to reflect the king. Here's a question. How, how can heaven come on earth if we don't reflect the God of heaven on earth? How, how can heaven come on earth? How can we see his kingdom done here? How can we see his will done here if we aren't willing to reflect what that looks like? And so church, you and I exist to reflect the greatness of God, to reflect the glory of God. I want to close with a parable of the talents. Jesus says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a master who before going on a journey gave talents to each of his servants. To one he gave five, to another he gave two, and another one he gave one. And so as the master went on his journey, the servant who had five invests what he had. The servant who had two invests what he had, and they double it. And the master comes back, and he sees what they have done, and, they, and he says, well, good done, thou good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your master. But to the one with one talent, he decided to take what he had, dig, and bury it. See, he didn't know God too well. He didn't know God too well. And so he, he digs up what God has given him, or he, he buries what God has given him. And you know what the master says? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servants. See, church, each of us have the ability to glorify God in many ways. We have been given potential, but, but our potential is not without purpose. Our potential must be used to glorify God. See, what you've been given has not been given without reason, and it's not been given without expectation. If you have been given this new purpose, purchased by the blood of Christ, then you are to do something with it. See, the servant with the least got caught up in his feelings. 
He didn't know God. He was afraid of God. And so all of a sudden, he let his preference control him rather than his purpose. I'm going to invite you to stand. And the worship team is going to lead us into this song. But church, my hope for us this morning, my, my prayer for us this morning is that we would live lives that would scream, look, look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. That we would live lives that when people would observe us, they would see God himself. We were purposed. Our purpose was poisoned. But thanks be to God that our purpose has been purchased. And now we have a choice. Live a life focused on my preferences or live a life focused on the purpose that God gave me to glorify Him, to reflect Him in everything we do, to worship Him with the very breath that he gave me worship team. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
Verse 21 says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand forever. So this morning, why, why should you pursue God's purpose over your preference? Because his purpose will outlast your preference. His purpose will outlast you. Church, God will be glorified. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so God will be glorified. The question here remains, will he be glorified through your life? Will he be glorified through everything you do? Will he be glorified as you walk as displays of his goodness? Church, God is inviting you into his purpose this morning. God is inviting you into his purpose this morning. God is inviting you. Maybe you haven't been purchased by the blood of Christ this morning. God is inviting you to once again enter into communion with himself. To have your purpose be purchased so that you can live a life that is a walking display of the glory of God, that you can live a life that shouts, look at what God has done. And so, Father, we praise you this morning. Father, we give you all the glory you deserve. We give you the praise you deserve, Father, and we thank you. We thank you, God, that you have purchased our purpose, God, and that you will enable us to walk as displays for your glory as you conform us into the image of your Son. Father, bless every person here today. God, may they leave. May they leave with a fire burning in their hearts that says, my existence is to display His existence. Father, we bless you. Bless your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.